another major change. But frankly, it's pretty simple. Over 80 years, calcium is central. So this is that 1980 or so model where you have sperm and egg together and somehow calcium increases inside the zygote. Now remember the zygote is the fused sperm and egg. But this is pretty simple for almost 100 years of work. This is our current model. This is my last publication, uh, I mean the last time I published this, uh, 2015. We've got now all these different arrows, all these different events. So I thought we'd go through just a little bit on how this more complex model, where you can see this goes to that, this one activates that, that one then activates this, but if this is really fast and you block it, then you get this over here activating this on a very slow pathway. Again, Mother Nature likes wearing a belt and suspenders, so there's always a backup system. Then you produce this thing here that releases calcium, then you get all these different fertilization events. And we've used inhibitors, they're in red here. We've added phosphatidic acid to mimic sperm. Uh, all this kind of stuff. Then IP3 is degraded, we've shown to these other um, molecules down here. So we'll take you through this, how this complex model actually occurred. So um, we've left off now about 1980 or so in the early 80s, uh, there were people who studied hormones, epinephrine and acetylcholine, and they studied lipid signaling. So it was, again, another unusual combination of lipid signaling where they found out that these hormones act to increase calcium uh, by activating an enzyme called PLC or phospholipase C, and it's this PLC pathway that's central for these hormones. Um, IP3 releases intracellular calcium. So this was in the hormone field, and obviously people in the fertilization field said, well, maybe PLC is important in fertilization. So in the 19, uh, about 1985, people started doing that, where they suggested this hormonal mechanism was happening at fertilization. Instead of a hormone, you've got a sperm. Sperm have been compared to hormones, though. And here's this pathway, once again, one lipid called PIP2, broken down by PLC to IP3 and DAG. DAG is a lipid. IP3 is a small sugar with lots of phosphates on it, very soluble. It diffuses from the membrane and causes a calcium release. Over here, the DAG is going to activate that enzyme I've talked about briefly, protein kinase C. Anyway, so they suggested this, that somehow sperm will activate PLC and you get IP3 and DAG. They suggested it in 1985, but that wasn't really proven until we published a paper in 1993. Anyway, so by the way, this also relates to cancer. Because cancer, calcium goes up often from cancer cells and dividing cells. And PKC, if you overactivate it with fluoroballesters, also we showed can result in meiotic cell division. So that pathway too is thought to be associated with cancer. So this is where we stood in the mid 1985s. We think that this is happening. Sperm are activating PLC, IP3 goes up. And you should expect equal amounts of IP3 and DAG being produced after you activate this PLC. So um, again, this is a summary of that. The new steps now are in red where instead of just sperm and egg calcium going up, you've got phospholipase C is activated, IP3 mass should increase, also DAG mass should increase the same amount, then IP3 itself will release calcium inside the zygote. That was the model, but again, it was tough to really show that. There are many other ways of increasing calcium. You can mimic fertilization by just poking a hole in the cell and calcium floods in. So why is is sperm really activating phospholipase C was the big question. Uh, in 1989, my first UCD paper, we did show that the um, IP3 did release calcium in xenoposol sites. We measured the calcium increase indirectly. So IP3 and IP4, um, initially IP4 was not thought to release calcium. But we showed this first uh, in vivo dose response other people had injected IP3, but they really didn't talk about 
how much IP3 uh, they recorded calcium differently. But still need to show that sperm actually increase IP3 and DAG since there are so many other ways the ranodine system poking a hole in the cell, those can also increase calcium. So very briefly here, we have two papers. Uh, others concluded that the IP3 mass assay did not work. And again, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but Chris was at a meeting presenting our stuff showing we can measure the IP3 mass in Xenopus. And he was at a place next to him were two famous researchers. One was Nucitelli, Richard Nucitelli from UC Davis. And uh, Chris overheard them saying, oh, this stiff guy has his paper. He can't measure IP3. We've tried it. We've tried it for a couple of years. There's no way he's measuring IP3 mass in Xenopus. You can't do it. And of course, he was big and famous, and we weren't. Anyway, we presented over, we spent many years, two years, that's a long time for us, on this IP3 assay alone, spent a fortune on grant money on the IP3 mass assay. We overcame multiple biochemical problems and uh, we were able to prove that it did work. So we worked on it with Xenopus ulcites and progesterone and insulin addition, and we worked on it on fertilization. So we used that methodology, which we developed carefully over a period of a couple of years, and we were published the first paper that IP3 mass does increase when you add sperm to egg about 300%. Uh, Nishitali later on published a half-assed paper that basically had all the numbers wrong, but he wasn't a biochemist. He was a more traditional developmental biologist. Once again, an advantage of having that combination of lipid biochemistry and fertilization knowledge, combining them in a new way. Nucitelli was not a lipid person. He was not a, much of a biochemist. He, he, was, he was more into the biophysics <coughs> of fertilization and an excellent researcher looking at the biophysics. But I'm just saying, it was interesting uh, those skills between two different fields allows you to make that unique niche and a breakthrough. We also published uh, sperm did not increase calcium to stimulate PLC, as many had suggested. 94, we um, um, found a new step in fertilization where the calcium that goes up in fertilization stimulated IP3 to IP4. And finally, we also published a paper showing the DAG mass. So remember, IP3. Uh, should increase about the same as this lipid diacylglycerol. And we showed that that wasn't really true. Summarizing this kind of stuff, just looking at it briefly here, IP3, it really shoots up in fertilization. And DAG, that also shoots up in fertilization, but notice the scale. This is picomol, this is femtomol. So pico uh, versus femto, a thousand fold difference you would expect the IP3 increase to be the same as the DAG increase, but that was not true. The DAG increase was much, much bigger. Anyway, at this point then, after our work, we did show that phospholipase C activation by looking at both the products and the reactants, IP3 mass increases, and also we found this other new step, that calcium increase stimulates IP2 metabolism to IP4. But the new steps again highlighted in red. But again, how does sperm activate PLC? Why is the DAG increase much, much bigger than the IP3 increase? And Kenichi Sato came along at this point. He was a person who looked at SARC activation in cancer. But he said, wow, this little, this uh, in fertilization, others had shown that tyrosine kinases like SARC are crucial to fertilization. So that was shown for invertebrates. Sea urchin was the major model system for fertilization. It's a rather primitive organism, and so you end up then, uh, he ended up then taking his expertise from cancer and SARC and applying it to fertilization. He found out that SARC tyrosine kinase is going to be the missing step between sperm and activation of phospholipase C. So this all points down to the fact that, you know, Lipids really were ignored and they now gaining respect. So we kept pushing the lipid side of it, and this is called the field of lipomics. We started developing uh, new techniques, as I mentioned, looking at lipids. We identified five new enzymes activated at fertilization. We had these publications on in journal of lipid research. And this is the kind of stuff we would have. There's tremendous amounts of data 
just like in genomics, we have tremendous numbers in lipomics. This was a Petkoff paper. This is one figure here. There's many different types of lipids. That's one why people ignore it. They, there's just not just one protein, like SARC is a protein, um, and PC or phosphatidylcholine is one lipid, but there are many different types of it. Adds to the complexity. So this paper, when we published it in 2008 on 14 different lipids during fertilization, was the first one, and frankly the only one since, that looked at lipid changes and was highlighted by ASB, ASBMB Today, the magazine for biochemistry and molecular biology. So we kept looking at the lipids. We suggested another phospholipase is activated. It's PLD. And so we found evidence. This is also activating at fertilization. This lipid here, that particular species, broken down by phospholipase D to choline, which does increase in fertilization. And finally, with Ryan Bates, first author on the 2014 paper, phosphatidic acid, another lipid that is very unique and now has been found to bind and activate 40-some different proteins. But when we started this, also it's broken down to DAG. When we started this, we centered then in on PA, this weird lipid, this is its structure. Here's a form, but it's incredibly charged here and it's relatively small head group. Charge density is very, very high. That's what's so different about this weird lipid. So we've centered in on it. We looked at the enzyme that produces it, this phospholipase D. We looked at what PLDs are present by RT-PCR. Also just did simple Western blotting. And we suggest that this one isoform is the one that's important in fertilization. So we 